Managing Director of an organisation called LSECT, based in the United Kingdom in London. And primarily, we publish two education newspapers, which focuses on the school sector in England and the United Kingdom, and FE Week, which fo focuses on the technical and vocational education training sector within England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. Um, I'm proud to say that um, FE Week is the official media partner for World Skills UK, and we've been involved with the World Skills movement for close to a decade. So I'm going to be the moderator for this morning's session. Just a few quick housekeeping notes before we kick off. Firstly, one of our speakers will be speaking in Russian for part of this morning's session. So on your way in, you should have been handed one of these. Is there anybody in the room without one of these radio set mics that needs one so they can understand the translations? Speakers, you will have the translators on your seats. Okay. Secondly, uh, to join in with the conversation on your social media channels, please ensure that you use the official conference hashtag, which is hashtag world skills across all social media platforms. That would be great. Secondly, uh, thirdly, sorry, you should find on your seats some voting cards, some red and green voting cards. Has everybody got a red and green voting card? Great. So during the session, some of our speakers may wish to ask the audience some questions. I, as a moderator, may also wish to ask some questions, just to get a sense of um, the views of the audience with us this morning. So uh, we will simply give you a yes or no answer, green meaning one and red meaning the other. So a quick test. Are you having a great World Skills Conference so far? Green for yes, red for no. Well, there's some indecisive people at the back. Green. We're all green, that's good. Who in the room, is this your first World Skills competition? The first time you've attended a World Skills competition? Green for yes, red for no. Very good, so we've got a mixed room here of some freshers. And some very seasoned, experienced World Skills attendees. We've just got a few more people joining us, which is fab. So, without further ado, shall we kick off? So this session is titled From Small Seeds, Growing Skills for Sustainable Agriculture. I think this is a really important session and a topic area I certainly feel doesn't get enough airtime and debate in my own home country, the United Kingdom. So I'm really excited to learn plenty from our panel this morning. With a growing population and changing climate, we are experiencing heightened food demand. Our agricultural systems must rapidly adapt. During the session this morning, we will examine the role of skills and vocational education in responding to the challenges posed by sustainable growth in agriculture. The discussion will include insights on the development and use of innovative tech to achieve these goals, opening new possibilities to increase productivity, respectful of natural resources, and improving, um, and improving the globe's livelihoods. During my reading and prep for this session, I was shocked by some of the statistics and conclusions from various reports published globally. Here are a couple of examples I think are worth mentioning before we start this morning's debate. 
By 2050, we will have a global population of 9 billion people. And according to the United Nations, food production needs to increase by 70% alone to feed a growing and urbanized wealthier population. Agriculture accounts for almost 20% of greenhouse emissions and roughly a third of the food we produce is waste or lost. And over 75% of the food we consume is generated from only 12 plants and five animal species. Agriculture employs a billion people globally. Some food for thought there before we kick off. So without further ado, let me introduce our incredible panel this morning. Uh, to my left, I'm pleased to welcome from Ireland, the Minister of State for Training, Skills, Innovation, Research and Development, John Halligan. From Zambia, the CEO of AgriPredict Solutions, which is an agro tech in Zambia and something we will learn a lot more about during this morning's debate, Mwila Kwangwa. And from Russia, Oleg Stapanov, the Director General and co-founder of Big Land, a non-profit organization for sustainable development and partner of LAGFA LAGFA. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome this morning's panel. Thank you. So panel, um, part one is how is agriculture changing in the context of today's challenges? And just to kick off, I'd like to welcome um, Oleg to say a few words to give a Russian perspective on this. So ladies and gentlemen, if you need the translation, please use your headsets. Oleg. Good morning, dear friends. So I represent a non-commercial organization which is dealing with the development of uh, agricultural areas in Russia. And we work in different regions. And I believe that for Russia, one of the major problems that we face here is the problem of depopulation and uh, desertment of uh, agricultural territories. Increasingly, young people, able-bodied population, are going away from rural areas. And after 10 years, if we meet here once again in 10 years, it is possible that a larger part of Russian rural areas will not be possible to speak about because there will be no population left there. So in our activities, we posed the following questions to ourselves. Why do people leave rural areas? And first and foremost, we see that the 20th century worldwide was the century of globalization. And in Russia, during the Soviet times, this was probably the time of globalization like as with the increasing speed and everything that was uh, local was just destroyed. When we had natural localization during the 19th century, the methods of uh, agriculture were natural, so to say we had natural food goods and people from different locations were different, and you could distinguish them by the decoration of their clothes, by their food they consumed, and also the Russian soup, which is called shi, made of cabbage. Uh, it was different in different territories. But today we see that in any small town, everybody is consuming pizza, sushi, everybody is having barbecue, and the value of this local in the global world is being absolutely destroyed. And I see that the main challenge that every one of us is facing now is to bring back the value of local products for this global world. And also, we have to understand how this global 
the global can be integrated uh, on the local level, at the local territory. And that's what we do in our daily activities. And we do it almost everywhere where we can. And I can set the following simple example. In Krasnodar region, in Oslobinsk neighborhood, it's quite a small town. It's an agricultural region. And there we see depopulation. About 1,000 people live annually from this region, mostly young people, of course. And we just take a look at what they train at school. Who would they like to be? They want to be lawyers, they want to be accountants, they want to be some managers of uh, something. And nothing of these professions, none of these professions is required in their neighborhood. And then we developed training programs to allow them to get their basic knowledge in chemistry, biology, physics, so that they could apply this knowledge to some specific training in uh, how to use the water in their territory, air, food, and um, earth in their territory. So we took some pieces of uh, samples of earth from Moscow, then from the regional center in Krasnodar, and we took some samples of the earth from different places in this Oslobinsk neighborhood. And based on the chemical analysis, we tried to demonstrate these students and these school students how these samples are different and what problems can be and what problems they have with these samples in their neighborhood. And so that's how we learned that uh, in this region there is a lot of sun and for agriculture they need some specific water technologies to be applied there. And we also see the erosion of uh, the earth. Uh, we see the mineralization of uh, the earth. And that's how we showed the specific link of technologies of bioprotection of plants, non-use of chemical agents, fertilizers. And we cannot connect these problems with the problem of mineralization and erosion of earth in their neighborhood. And that's how these school students understood how new global technologies of sustainable agriculture can be integrated and applied in their region and how they are connected to the problems of the specific earth in their territory. And the same we did with food, with water, with air. And I believe that rehabilitation of this local value within this global world, as well as integration of global innovations uh, at the local level. This is our challenge of today. We all have to live in a new era, in the era of localization. I thank you for your attention. We heard some interesting perspectives there from the Russian perspective, and I think actually they could be applied globally, certainly in terms of this transition and mass movement from uh, rural areas into big metropolis urban cities. How do, we, uh, how do we ensure that agriculture is a spicy, interesting career path for young people? Minister, could you explain from an Irish perspective what you've been doing there? Absolutely, and I suppose, look, if, if you look at the Irish perspective, Ireland is a green, fertile, mild climate uh, uh, which uh, has been for thousands of years and essentially um, ideal for farming. As a matter of fact, all the rain that we like to complain about falls in Ireland regularly <laughs> and uh, you see um, uh, it ideally, su ideally suited for farming for thousands of years. But I suppose since we joined the European Union, um, Ireland has become uh, uh, economically not so much dependent on farming. I think 8.5% 
of our workforce now are in the farming industry, but it is traditionally part of our heritage and our culture of farming. And interesting, if I can just jump ahead, how important farming has been to us in Ireland, that because of our expertise in farming and because of the climate, uh, in international farming research, we're number one in the world, and in agri-science, uh, we're number two in the world. But to answer your question, um, I think that, um, as my comrade from Russia has said, the issue has always been that farming was predominantly done in rural areas because that's where farming essentially is, the ethos of farming is. And uh, it has always been, if you like, dictated as being um, poorly paid, hard work, tough work, long hours. And so you did have a decline in uh, very many people taking up farming in rural, er rural areas. So there's, two, there's three issues here. The issue is, uh, first of all, um, improving technology to make people's quality of life who are working on farms a better quality of life yep. and to have it paid. That's very important. Two is to make farming, if you like, a, a skill and an innovation skill. Uh, and that means that it's a good paying job and worth bringing our young people in. And three, of course, is investing. It's all about investing. That you, if you're developing, developing a, prod, a product for it to be good for you economically, the first thing your government will have to do is invest in that product. Mm -hmm. So you have to invest in the skills producing the product. And I understand that the Irish government have recently announced a sort of 6.3 million euro fund to, to look at the use of drone technology. Yes, well, if you look at, if you look at uh, uh, we were talking about climate change, or we will be talking about climate change, um, it's actually in my own constituency we're doing that. And, uh, you know, the, the, the drone technology, uh, and by the way, satellite technology, uh, which we are developing in Ireland and has been developed in other countries around the world, is the way forward for directing of farming. Uh, cattle yield, weather, crops, uh, tagging of cattle from satellite, Yep. And all of this can, by, by, by farm management, can be done by computer. So we're developing uh, substantial drone technology over the next number of years. It's in the early stages, but it's, it's worked quite successfully for us. And uh, that's part of the technolog technological advances. And it comes back to what I was saying, that the daily trudge for young farmers to get up at five in the morning and maybe work until two the next morning, yep. that uh, in order to entice people into farming, we have to up our technology, and part of that is drone technology and satellite imaging. Change the image. Change the image, absolutely. And is that certainly the case over in Zambia? Um, yeah, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for uh, inviting us here. Um, you know, coming from uh, Africa, Zambia to be specific, um, it's, it's interesting to hear what both of my colleagues have mentioned, first of all, because uh, these are global problems, right? Whether uh, coming from an Af African perspective, uh, with what Oli had uh, mentioned of, uh, you know, the younger generation uh, moving to, you know, highly densely populated areas and leaving the rural areas to go and look for something else there yep. other than farming. And what the minister had uh, said is also all about the image. and. I must agree with that, and this is something that we, as AgriPredict, try to change, right? We, uh, our hashtag is making farming cool, right? You have to make yep. it cool. Uh, and in order for you to make it cool, you must have the right available information that will attract a youthful person into getting into that profession and respecting it, right? Um, so, you know, that's... That's, that's all I can say on the, on the and, subject. Uh, Oleg, from a Russian perspective, is, is farming agriculture seen as a, a cool subject to study yet in Russia? Well, you know, this is kind of a problem. And my friend and partner, Boris Okimov, he was at the meeting with the chairman of the government, uh, which opened the world skills uh, together with uh, Mr. Medvedev uh, the, the day before yesterday at the stadium. And he said that the major addressing the major solution to the problem of the depopulating territory 
how can we address that? We should make this life look trendy. We should make this life look fashionable. And Medvedev didn't understand him. And he said, what does it mean, like, trendy? It is not about rural areas at all. But you are absolutely right. People living rural areas, they don't want to do anything connected to agriculture because for them to drive a tractor or combine to milk a cow or clean after a cow, this is not trendy. This is the thing of a past. And everything which is trendy, it is located in the big city. And that's why in Russia, here is such a motto, which is quite popular now, you have to just leave. You have to run away. I, I don't know how our translators will translate it. So you have to leave rural areas uh, first to the regional center, then from regional center to Moscow and St. Petersburg, and from Moscow and St. Petersburg to London, Paris, and New York. And we, have, we can deal with that only if we show that here we do have the local values that, that are worthy, that are interesting, trendy, and that are really valuable in this global world. And when we connected the problems of earth, water, and air to the just technologies that were also said about by Mr. Halligan, the uh, methods of biosafety, the precision in agriculture, which is connected to trendy, with modern, with global. If we show all this, students change their perspective, change their attitude towards what they can do in agriculture. So for them, these global innovations, they understood, students, that they could apply these innovations in their life today and here. And the same thing goes about the local, local cuisine. Well, it was funny. We were doing this program involving restaurants from small cities who were giving out pizza and barbecue and sushi to people. Uh, and we asked them, so what do you eat, where you come from, in your neighborhood, what traditional food do you usually eat? And the answer was, it's this uh, pickled uh, fish that we eat, uh, but I've never really eaten uh, that kind of fish. How come you don't sell this uh, dish uh, at your restaurant, which is your local, uh, local dish? How come would everyone need it in the restaurant? Um, Th this was the answer, because uh, if you want to eat pizza, you need to go to Italy. If you want to eat uh, sushi, you need to go to Japan. But in this case, there will be this specific kind of pickled fish that you would have to go and eat uh, in your region, and this will be your hallmark. Um, and Italians will, ha will have their pizza. And when we came up with a local menu for these kind of restaurants, all everyone who were tasting out these uh, traditional um, fishes, uh, this uh, um, roast soup and uh, pike uh, meatballs and other things, they kept saying, other people kept saying, because well, they knew all these dishes and they were like, you know, I cook this dish differently. My grandma used to cook it different, uh, differently. So that's this peak interest, their interest in local uh, cuisines, um, because if they are able to drum up that interest, then other people will have this interest. Even champagne, in champagne, uh, people uh, didn't like champagne. It would not be favorite all over the world. We have to start with ourselves first. We need to understand our local stuff, and only then, after we have a grasp of that, will it have any importance in globally. Committed to sort of the movement of buying locally, um, that you're seeing the change in diets, the, the, the rise in popularity in veganism is certainly something we're seeing uh, in Europe and, and Northern America. I'm not sure if, if veganism is a, is a popular diet trend in Africa yet or Russia, but I'm sure it's, it will flourish sooner or later. Minister, you wanted to just interject there around the, the views of young people. Yeah, I think that... We have to look on, uh, once we look on agriculture and farming as another industry, no different in the sense that you have to invest, but you also have to 
uh, invest in the skills that are needed for agriculture at present and then for future skills. So how do you do that? And it's as, as you would do with the STEM subjects mm -hmm. as we do across schools, science, technology, engineering and maths. You have to introduce agriculture and agro-science into schools at an early stage, vocation. And I would actually advocate that we try to introduce it as you come out of first term primary school into secondary school. And of course, uh, when you do that, you develop an interest. And we do that in Ireland. The last, uh, before you go after third level education, before you go into, or sorry, before you go into a university or an institute of technology, you do what's called the Leaving Cert. So we have agri science on the Leaving Cert in 440 schools in Ireland. And every year that's increasing because there is an uptake. Mm -hmm. Uh, from students. So when you see the capacity that's there to learn the skills in future agri agri agriculture, and by the way, it is, it is trendy. Uh, my colleague here used the word cool, yeah. because you see students now, they were talking about drone technolo technology, genomics that we're dealing with in Ireland, and we have a pilot scheme working here in Tartistan. Uh, you're talking about satellite technology, satellite imaging on farms and so on. So that makes it very interesting for people. Like some of the skills we have are farm technician. You wouldn't have heard of a farm technician maybe 10, 20 years ago. Yeah. Farm management. So I think that once you introduce the su subject um, as a core subject in your schools early on, it absolutely generates interest and that's been shown in Ireland. Brilliant. Thank you. So uh, just moving on to part two of the session, we're looking at um, transitioning towards a more sustainable agriculture. And the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, defines sustainable agriculture as the practices that or orient technological and institutional change in such a manner as to meet the needs of present and future generations. Such practices manage and conserve the natural resource base, conserving land, water, plant and animal genetic resources. They are environmentally non-degrading, technically appropriate, economically viable, and socially acceptable. Everyone now familiar with their definition? Great. So, is the future of agriculture based on biotech, robotization, and artificial intelligence, or is it a comeback to traditional, ancient, and local models? Mirela, can you talk, talk us through what's happening in Zambia there with tech? Um, well, tech is... Uh booming now on the Zambian scene, um, but I would like to say it's a bit of both. Um, okay. Introducing technology and also falling back onto some of the traditional uh, ways of agriculture. Where I come from, we have um, 73 dialects. That means it's 73 ways of doing different things, and even in agriculture, you can see that, yep. the way they do it. Um, I'm Bemba by tribe. Say again, sorry? I'm Bemba by tribe. Okay. Um, and the Bembas have a system called, um, it's, a, it's a common farming practice called Chitamene system, where, you know, farmers cut down trees and burn the land in preparation for cultivation, right? But it doesn't really do any good um, for the climate. Right, those are the cons, part of the cons of the tradition. We're sticking with the tradition, so this is why um, even us as AgriPredict, we try and introduce these technologies with new information, uh, much better ways, sustainable ways for people to actually go into agriculture without affecting the environment and um, also boosting up their productivity. So. So technology is playing a big part in, in terms of making it a cool, trendy activity. But what, what about the infrastructure costs there for creating a 21st century farm? Right. Um, the costs are a little bit high. But again, if you look at it um, from the perspective of um, how much you are actually uh, you know, saving the planet, for example, right, in terms of climate change, uh, it's something that is actually worth it at the moment. Um, I like how the minister is talking about, you know, creation of drones and all these other things that are happening in Ireland. These are the same things that are going on in Zambia because yep. yes. we're also using these things to just farm smarter. Of course, it's a little bit high on the cost of just setting that up, but, you know, the long-term uh, impacts is what we are actually looking for, you know, and many people are gravitating towards that, right? So, I, I think it's, 
like again it's all around innovation and advanced technology mm -hmm. and I keep saying this and I think it's important that innovation is a driver in all aspects of your economy so you can't uh, like uh, if you look at Ireland where all of the top uh, multinational companies 1,500 of the top multinational companies in Ireland many of them agri companies biopharma companies and so on and also um, um, uh, the 12 top pharmaceutical companies are there in Ireland now why is that relevant it's relevant because they are all involved in advanced te technology uh, to make sure that our companies can deal in the next 10, 20, 30 years. The same has to apply with agriculture. Mm -hmm. We have to advance technologies on the farm. That means you have to invest in technology to make it more efficient, uh, more sustainable agriculturally, which has been asked for right across the world. The only way, we will not do that with the old tradition in farming. We can't. Uh, we will always have old traditional farming. You can't not but have that. But it's up to our scientists and our young innovators to show that we can change technology. Like, it's like um, we were talking about um, uh, a simple thing like your cattle in a field. Yep. Like, the tradition now is for the farmer to have to go out into the field in the morning, early in the morning, get them out and get them in at, at dusk. Mm. There is now satellite technology that all of the animals are marked and are driven by satellite. It's a burst onto the thing that guides the cattle. And so that's advancing technology. And like, again, if you look at where ta technology has been, where it is and where it'll be in 20 years, like it'll be up to our scientists, our agri-scientists, and of course, uh, the farmers and all of the countries we're dealing with working with farmers to make sure that they become part of the advancement of technology. Just on the, on the sustainability angle uh, of agriculture and technology, what, what are you doing in Ireland to ensure that um, f farming is changing and they are becoming a more sustainable, eco-friendly environment? Well, once again, it's all about education. And there are, uh, if you like, uh, we started um, uh, uh, with genomics, as you know, mm -hmm. and the idea there was to make, uh, for instance, a simple thing to make cat cattle more docile, more fertile, uh, milk yield, um, to ascertain quickly if uh, a disease was prevalent in cattle, and that's very, that's very important. And that's uh, some of our big scientific, that's a big scientific advancement uh, that we're using here in, in the Russian Federation at present, and they've acknowledged this to be top class. Other technology, again, is that um, we have to be able to determine whether technology, whether we like it or not. It's like um, tractors having to work uh, in soggy fields, uh, which requires more power from tractors and so on. We have to up our technology, even a simple thing in the development of devices or tractors and so on, to move sure. along farms. But from so, an education and skills perspective, yes, what are Ireland doing there to ensure that the, the teachers are qualified to pass this knowledge on? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, um, I was making the point that we are now doing agri-science on, on the premier leaving subject uh, in 430 institutions in Ireland. And... Uh, there is what we call the Institute of Technology, where I come from, Waterford Institute of Technology in, uh, in, in Waterford, is driving agri-science around the world. That's put us into a position where uh, we're number two in agri-science in the world. So Ireland is now seen as a place to develop technology, advance technology, but also uh, to share and consolidate our technology. It's interesting that uh, we set up a group of, uh, which I think it was Scotland, Denmark and Holland mm. uh, over the last number of years. And the idea there was to share advanced technology in farming and to see how we could develop and work with sustaining uh, uh, farming. And that's worked very successfully. And what that simply meant was that scientists in the agri se sector would come together and monitor farms in Ireland, Denmark, Holland, and see how we could advance the technology there, and that's been successful. But if anybody thinks it's easy, it's difficult, because it's, it's predicated by weather yes. all of the time. You have a farm that's flooded out for five or six days in weather. Whatever technology you have, it's very difficult. You still have to work on that farm. But I think it is adv advancing exceptionally well, certainly in Ireland it is, and in other countries around the world. And I think I should say this, that this is why it's very important, and this is part of us being on this panel today, that we need more than ever because of what's happening in the world. 2.5 billion people in the world 
uh, by 2050, it means we have to grow more crops. Yeah. We have to have more cattle. We have to have more sheep. We have to have more chickens. We have to have more food. We will now more than ever need to collaborate and cooperate in our technological advances. We can't hide it from one another. So on the technology point, Mila, can you, I think now would be a good moment to actually hear a bit more about your product, AgriPredict. But before I invite you to speak, I think we've got a fun video to watch. Yeah, so um, that is our little application um, at AgriPredict. And like I mentioned, right, we make farming cool. We exist because we want to make farming cool, which means driving more uh, of the youth um, into adopting some of these technologies. Now, why does this technology exist? Well, um, we specifically made it for uh, the farmers to be able to recognize um, pests and diseases uh, using artificial intelligence and machine learning, right? So what they simply do is just pull out their smartphone, take a picture of the crop if they really do, do not understand what's happening with the crop, take a picture of it, and um, the system will give them a diagnosis, treatment options, and location to the nearest agro dealer shop. Um, one of the other reasons why we came up with this is also for you know, to give farmers that kind of power, right, to understand these things as a way of just teaching them and educating them to say, okay, so if your crop looks like this, then this is what's affecting it, and this is the type of uh, chemical or natural um, uh, way of just getting rid of whatever pests um, and diseases. Another thing that we have on the application is the weather forecast, right? Believe it or not, um, not many people have access to AccuWeather in Zambia, an application like that, right? Here, we take it for granted, but mm. back in Zambia, and if you're looking at the small-scale farmers, not everyone has that application. So we're looking at providing that information for the farmers, um, especially with the fact that they do not have access to irrigation, first of all. Okay. Most of them depend on um, rain patterns, you know, most of the times. But as we know, with climate change, you know, the, 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 the patterns are a bit sporadic right now. So what used to work in the olden days, and I'll give you for an example, it, it would rain every 24th of October, which happens to be our Independence Day, right? And that would be a sign. So we say, okay, so depending on how it rains then, that will show us the patterns for November, right? And it will help farmers better prepare, right, for the farming season then. But now it's different because rain doesn't even come till maybe December sometimes or even January. And most of the farmers are ignorant to that fact, uh, not of their own doing, of course, but uh, just because there isn't that much tech, um, education. So what training infrastructure is there to support you know, young farmers, farmers there today to understand the environmental impact yeah, of their, so, on their practices? Um, I, I would have to speak on the perspective of um, AgriPredict itself and why we exist. And we exist to do exactly just that, to train farmers to uh, sensitize, if, if, if you may, right, on uh, what is happening with the climate and how you can counter uh, some of these happenings. Right, um, you want to increase your productivity. You must be willing to invest, like the minister said. Right, so invest in some form of irrigation, invest in some uh, form of you know security on your farm. Right, yeah. invest in uh, you know getting some satellite technology data out there and really understanding it and how you can prevent or uh, counter or you know. Uh, figure out a way forward for, you know, however it is that you're going to increase your productivity, and that's what we do. Uh, currently, we are piloting our product in uh, the eastern part of Zambia, and um, so far we have 22,000 farmers uh, on the platform that are using it and that are appreciating it, and, uh, you know, it's just all about education and also making sure that young people understand and respect farming as we call it in Zambia as a business yeah you know that's that's where it's at and we, is there is there concern the, the same as within Russia around people moving and globally the, the issue around young people moving from rural communities into the big cities that are more techno technologically advanced right right um, you know and it, it poses such a huge threat but like I said right uh, 
I, I could go into so much of what can be done, um, especially with the help of the government and whatnot. One of the things I would talk about is decentralization, right? Mm -hmm. And also uh, putting agriculture on that pedestal that it deserves, right? Because um, in all actuality, agriculture is a billion dollar business, but people don't really understand that, right? If somebody wants to get into agriculture in Zambia, the information is scarce. It's hard for them to find. So they don't feel the need to get into that. They just think it's an old practice that should be done by 60 and above. Is the government doing anything about this in Zambia? Or around? There, there are a couple of programs out there, but I don't think they're as aggressive. And I don't think they're as attractive, okay. uh, if I may say. Um, an application like ours is really, really attractive because there's also social media engagement. Right? Hashtag the cool farmers. Take a picture and tell us what yeah, you yeah. think. You know what I mean? So people are getting excited yeah. about that. And especially when we go for these trainings in the eastern part, we see so many young people jumping up and down just to say, look, I know the problem of my crop just by taking a picture. I have weather patterns. ETC. Cool. Mina, yes, just, just very briefly, what we do is we've developed what we call with transition year school, uh, schools. We get the schools themselves to develop modules on agriculture and entrepreneurship within agriculture. And that would, would be with the help of industries mm -hmm. and uh, Chagas, our, our main uh, driving partner in... Uh, is this the gap year project? That, yes, yeah. yes. So uh, what happens is, like we were speaking earlier on about kind of um, uh, uh, early education uh, in agriculture and agri-science, that what has been found is that if you have collaboration and cooperation with the farming organisations in our country, and uh, uh, with the big drivers of farming in Ireland, that you allow the students themselves to develop their own modules yep. and become young entrepreneurs, because it works the same in all other, other industries. And we have found that that is where uh, the basis of technology and further interest in farming starts to develop uh, early tuition in schools. And I mean, like, we'll all have to do that sooner or later. We can't just leave it uh, for, uh, you know, traditionally what would have happened was a family on the farm and the son would take over, the daughter would take over, or, and then after that the son would take over. But what happened was that if it wasn't profitable, if the work was too tough, uh, they would leave rural areas. So what, we, what we've had to do, and the challenge is to make farming uh, national in Ireland, that it isn't that you're living in a city mm -hmm. and you don't know anything about farming, or the nearest farmer is about 50 miles away. What we've started to do is develop modules in all of the schools in our cities uh, to uh, explain, first of all, the importance to our economy of farming and uh, the importance of the sustainability of our economy by continuing to invest in agriculture, but also, as I said earlier on, to show the importance that uh, there is good quality jobs. And if you're a scientist and if, you, if you're interested in science, you can, be, you can get a job in developing technology for farming, and that's worked very well. So I think, again, we should be concentrating back into the schools, uh, get the kids themselves, or those young scientists, that are good. Yeah. And uh, traditionally, it's the young scientists that, have, that become our future scientists. And if you do that by developing the modules, make them entrepreneurs in agriculture. That was my next question was around, you know, should we be teaching, should there be entrepreneurial thinking um, in, in the training of, of, of young farmers? Because they're, they're very complex technical businesses at, at, at the heart. It's not as simple as traditional agriculture as we think of, you know, a combine harvester and digging up fields and sowing, the, sowing plant, plantations, etc. It's, you know, there is a lot of bioscience involved now. You've got the use of drone technologies and examples of that. Ola, can you talk us through um, from, a, from a Russian perspective, what the sort of key competencies are for uh, a young Russian farmer? Well, we had this well, we had this great experience. So where we were using sustainable farming in a, in a specific municipality, in a specific district. This is uh, um, basically black land where we were working. Uh, historically, people have been farming there. And, uh, you know, it brings a very good harvest. Uh, the farmers there are rich, independent people 
who do not take that face value when there is some man coming from Moscow starting uh, to sing the praises of sustainable farming. They don't understand these farmers why they would have to spend money now to uh, invest uh, to integrate these uh, sustainable farming practices. So we were starting to think as to how these expense, uh, these rich and uh, independent people could be shown why they would have to take interest and invest in introducing sustainable farming methods and practices. Basically, we did the following. We studied the damage uh, caused by soil mineralization in this area. In this area, district, uh, so the soil does not recover by 3 percent. It's 140 million rubles or 2 million dollars is the worth or the cost of damage. It may not sound like much, but over a 10-year period, uh, the recovery of soil by 3% per annum amounts to 30% of the land fertility in this area. So basically, we demonstrated to these farmers that in 10 years, the economic capability of farming there would be gone. And uh, here we collected this forum of people who do agro business, basically farming business. And, and so in this logistic area, we got them together a major uh, agro holding, uh, owning 50,000 hectares of land and, and rich farmers over five th owning over 5,000 hectares of land who were ready to invest. And also we invited Russian scientists who uh, were who had like solid developments uh, in precision for agriculture or farming and satellite monitoring developments to monitor agro fields and biological protection methods. Well, we, it took us a lot of work to flesh out their reports, as their reports didn't have to focus on their methods only, but also it would have to break down the costs, uh, the investments into the integration of these methods, what needed to be purchased uh, for them to be integrated, and the economic effect from integrating uh, these developments uh, would be there for these farmers. And it went over with a bang. Uh, because um, the director of this uh, agro holding, agriculture holding, said that two million dollars is uh, the cost of his own interest in the methods of sustainable farming per year. We got a lot of calls later uh, from people who were asking about the, for the phone numbers of these uh, practitioners and scientists with the developments in sustainable farming, and we invited the scientists from all over Russia, also from the Innopolis, which is a, uh, a center near Tatarstan, Kazan, from Skolkova in Moscow, from Novosibirsk, and uh, people developed interest in the integration of sustainable farming methods when they were shown in simple terms why it uh, would be interesting and the economic effect it would generate. Thank you. Your work with SNV, the NGO there, in terms of entrepreneurial skills for young farmers. Right. Um, so SNV is the Netherlands Development Organization. Um, it's an NGO out in Zambia, and they have a program that's running in the eastern province called uh, the SILMS Project, which is the Sustainable Integrated Land Management Systems. Um, AgriPredict is a plug-in of that project. Um, in a sense that uh, you know, SNV really wanted us to introduce uh, technology to some of the farmers um, out there. Right? They've engaged themselves into uh, learning about forestry and how can they can improve their yields using other traditional methods, but technology piece was missing from that. 
And um, so this is the type of work that we've been doing with them. Uh, they gave us access to those 22,000 farmers that I was talking about uh, who signed up successfully and are using the, the, the platform successfully as well. Um, so yeah, that's the, that's the work with SNV that we're doing at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, you know, sustainability, uh, I think one of the, the, the key um, things that we are using as uh, AgriPredict in Zambia is that, first of all, formal employment is very hard to come by for the youth. Right? Okay. So the next best thing that they're looking at is how can I make it themselves. in agriculture, yeah. right? And by themselves, obviously, mm -hmm. but in agriculture, because um, you know we have so much land that's there in Zambia, and almost anything can grow anywhere uh, in Zambia. But even the youth, most of them have an acre or two, or even more sometimes, but they don't really know what to do with it. And these are the guys that we really want to tap into to say, look, we have this existing product, uh, a cool product that can teach you how to respect agriculture as a business, how you can start from you know, just a beginner to be an expert and to make some good money out of it while feeding the nation, because that's the whole point. Cool. And I just want to move on to the role of government. Oleg, could you um, explain uh, what is taking place in Russia in terms of the, prom the promotion of agriculture and agricultural institutions? Are government doing enough in Russia to, to promote those institutions and looking at the curriculum and, and what young farmers are taught? Well, you know, I will have to be very short on the topic as uh, my opinion is that, yes, now this is so something that we are doing. Everyone is talking about it. However, it, uh, it all kind of results in just some forums and conferences being held. Uh, and this is where it stops. Uh, there is some global talk about uh, uh, local methods and sustainable uh, the farming methods. But unfortunately, uh, well, it uh, doesn't really happen in regions or locally on sites. Well, there is bureaucracy, we all know that, but the Russian red tape is uh, more pronounced is, uh, uh, when it comes to farming, sustainable farming. And when we uh, are having negotiations with uh, different officials from the government, they think everything is fine. They keep telling us how many billion rubles have been uh, expended on farmers, how many billion rebels have been expanded uh, on sustainable farming uh, integration and assistance and aids. However, these billions of rebels have been mostly spent on holding conferences, and it doesn't uh, uh, go a long way in uh, changing the lives of, uh, of farmers for the better. However, in, when we see farmers uh, leave from these uh, uh, meetings of officials uh, at the government places, so they say that the, we and the government live in separate worlds. So farmers take their own initiative to change something in their world for the better, so change our lives for the better. But state support, it's my personal opinion, is absolutely not effective. Agriculture or Minister of Training, so to speak, in, in Russia, what, what key change would you make to ensure that there were uh, professionally trained um, instructors in agriculture to ensure that they have the skill set to train the future generations? Because it sounds like there's a big gap there in Russia between uh, the professional staff having the professional competencies in order to train young people properly and effectively. What key change would you make? Uh, all in all, these are these uh, key uh, skills that we're talking about here that are needed. And I understand that the biggest problem 
fear is that I lack the competence of a minister. I have the position that I have, and I do not have the competence of a minister or the minister. But I will give an example. Here in Tatarstan, we visited this Muslimovsky district of Tatarstan, 300 kilometers away from Kazan, uh, which borders on Bashkortostan. And this region amazed me, astounded me, because they have this great park on the Ik River, which used to be just a swamp land. And there, there is a settlement with a population of just 8,000 people. It houses great a great infrastructure of hospitals and schools. The head of this district, when we were walking together, I asked him, where did you get the money? And he said uh, it was uh, the state funds and local businesses have uh, also invested 50 million rubles. Uh, and also, the people there, the citizens are there, they chip in, basically, uh, to uh, make something happen, to build something. The local tractor camp or station uh, has developed this uh, popular model. In Russia, it's uh, like a truck. We have this gazelle truck, farmer truck. So instead of like a fuel-powered engine, they did, developed an electric engine for it and installed it on it. There is also a diary plant in this small settlement which produces milk. So what I want is I would want for the government to take their cue or to rely, to use these examples. Because I, when I was walking with the head of the district, I told him that I want this place to be the skull cover for farming innovations. Conferences need to be held there. And in your district, like we have these real vivid examples of how an agricultural district can be improved, how it can be interesting and convenient for a living in. Uh, and uh, some uh, of the activities uh, as part of uh, the World Skills competition here, I think, should have been taken there so that uh, we could see in real life how these people manage to develop and hone these skills. We have this example. Minister in the room. Um, who, yes. who can enact change. Uh, but I'm not too sure if you're fortunate. <laughs> <laughs> so, Minister, uh, how can governments increase the attractiveness of agricultural institutions and agriculture as a profession and, and also ensure higher quality training in yeah. agriculture? Yeah, I suppose that's the most important question. And I suppose if you look at Ireland, we export uh, 13 billion worth of farm shop produce every year, so that has a fundamental effect on our economy. So uh, it is inherent on the government then, and on governments to make sure that we invest in farming, which we do. Uh, we, we have a substantial investment in farming every year. And it's important to say this, and I think like, we have to look again into the future of our investment in farm. If, and, and this is relevant to what governments need to do and what they should be doing. In the near future, we're facing four big problems, I think. We're, we're facing water stress for, for crops, we're facing heat stress towards animals, we're facing plant diseases that are rare now but may not be in the future, and we're also facing mobility of machinery. Yep. So if you take those four issues, and I don't think there's any question that we will face this uh, if climate change continues to change the way it is over the next 10, 15, 20 years. So you can see where governments have to be proactive. They have to make sure that they have the knowledge, the technology, and the finance to invest in one of their biggest industries. And there would be very few countries around the world, and I, can, I know Zambia is a great farming industry, and Russia is. But if you look at Europe itself, with the t temperature and climate, and it's, it's, there's a lot of uh, their economy depends on farming. South America, Brazil. Argentina and so on depends on farming and so on. So uh, governments have to uh, make sure they invest, but they also have to make sure that they have the expertise. We will only have the expertise if we invest in skills, if we invest in traineeships, if we invest, if we can urge our brightest people uh, to become involved in farming. 
Ireland is number two in nanotechnology. Why? Because we have invested. Uh, there is an area in Ireland, uh, uh, um, uh, in Cork, and my advisor is sitting there, he's from Cork, Allen, and it's called Tyndall. Last year, we gave 70 million to that area to, mm. to work in uh, nanotechnology because they're doing so good. This is what you have to do in agriculture. We've done that, and this is why we're good in agri-science, and I think um, uh, governments have to wise up that I started by saying earlier on that by 2050 we have to feed another 2.5 billion people. They'd predominantly still be fed from yeah. farm and produce. You have to invest, you have to upskill, and you have to make and sure... And from a training know. perspective, what's the employer voice there in terms of, I think you, you've got a, a fairly... Uh, you're investing heavily in, in the apprenticeship programme over Absolutely, in Ireland, yeah. and you're looking at this off-the-job training element of Absolutely. three days in study, two days in the workplace. Yes. How, how is that developing, and what's the conversation it's, like with the agriculture it's developing, industry? It's developing very well. All our agencies are working together, even our trade unions and so on. We all work collectively to make sure that if somebody has an interest in farming and agriculture, that we can find a position for him on a farm. Uh, but all, what we do, first of all, we make sure that they get the, the education needed uh, in the agri-subjects in mm -hmm. school, and then into the apprenticeship after that onto the farms. Is it, is it a challenge in Ireland to get the employers to accept them onto work placements? Um, it's a challenge they get that everywhere, and it would be remiss of me to say it's not a challenge, but we are dealing with it. And, uh, for instance, like if uh, uh, we've had a problem with maybe uh, a gender problem with bringing uh, 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 young women into training, but we now pay employees, we pay employers, we pay them an extra 250 euro, euro per person to take on, and that's been very successful for us. And uh, um, we think that, uh, like our apprenticeships have dramatically increased, as a matter of fact, they've increased 80% in three years. The reason for that is we invest, we invest in quality apprenticeships, we make sure that people in apprenticeships are treated well. Mm. Uh, that they have a quality of life in the workplace and they get a reasonable rate of pay. And that transcends all the way from agri-science uh, 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 right up to, to the basic apprenticeships, craft, craft apprenticeships. Apprenticeship. So it's all about investing and it's all about making sure that the person that takes up the apprenticeship at the end of the day, that he has a job that he will be able to go to. And that job uh, will enhance his, his or her quality of life. And that's why like, we now have developed... Uh, 46 apprenticeships in Ireland. And, uh, How many of those are focused on agriculture? Uh, there's about nine at present. Uh, like we would have an um, uh, agri-technician, um, uh, uh, agri-management and so on, uh, biopharma, part of the biopharma. Are they, are, they, are, they, are they a popular option for young people they at the are moment? Becoming, they're becoming more and yeah. more popular, particularly in the last five or six years, because what we did was very simply, we'd, we'd done an advertising campaign and we have an online website uh, that you can go on to, and all you've got to do is click Apprenticeships in Ireland, and from A to Z, yeah. I don't know if there's any in the Z, but you'll find... Zoology. Your, your, zoology, yeah, yeah, there could be. You'll find your, uh, you'll find your apprenticeships. Yeah. So when you come to your apprenticeships, you come to agriculture, it'll give you the list, it'll give you the contacts, it'll give you the qualification sure. leaders, whether you reach level five, six, seven, or eight, and uh, social media, everybody is... So if you, if you put in high, high quality training programs there, young people will see it as a well, well invested um, heavy industry. But it's not only that, I think uh, young people feel that they are being invested in. Okay, cool. And that's what matters. Thank you. We've just got uh, a quick couple of minutes for opportunities for any questions. Anybody in the room have any questions? Can I just see a raise of hand if you've got a question? I see one delegate in the room. <laughs> uh, Mark? Thank you. Uh, Mark Dahl, um, I represent apprenticeship providers in, in the UK. And it's been a fascinating debate, and while educators don't have the competence of a minister, ministers don't have the competence of an educator, which is why we all have to work together on this. My, my question is around the traditional versus the modern farming, um, and I used to run a college where we did land-based studies, and a lot of the students joined because of the lambing, because of being with animals, and not because of the science and technology. Um, but a lot of the conversation has been about that and modern farming. So how do we describe the skills needs of the modern farmer? And, you know, will they still need to learn to lamb or will satellites be able to somehow do that? Um, and how do we attract the right people in? You know, because it's a real interesting mix of skills we're now going to be asking for. I'm intrigued as to how a satellite could 
could lamb a lamb, but uh, I <laughs> <laughs> don't know where Mark's mind was going there. Minister. Yeah, well, I think that's a very good question, a very important question for the future. And um, one of the things that we do need to know and need, uh, uh, need to acknowledge is, as I said earlier on, I've been saying consistently, is the advancement of technology over the next 10, 15, 20 years. And if you recall, I did say that, you know, no matter how far we, we advance, we will still have to work on the farm. We will still have to monitor our cows and our sheep and so on. Although some, it can be done from your mobile phone or your computer now, in your office or in your bedroom or in your kitchen, which has been done. But I think it's, it's a question of amalgamating the skills that we have with the farmers that are there already. We can't forget that they are still the expertise, not so much the scientists from our Institute of Technology or our, our, our university. Uh, so what we do in Ireland is that all of the, there's a monitorisation program with many of the farms in Ireland uh, where we do an assessment consistently every few months, whether it's beef farming, milk, uh, milk produce and so on. And then we align that up with uh, the scientific analysis that we would have uh, 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 built on over the years and see how we can move forward in that. So you're right, it's a combination of old style farming, um, uh, it's not versus, it's working with uh, further technology and technological events. And you could be quite correct in 10, 20, 30 years' time with the advancement of technology. It's possible a farmer may be just sitting down, pressing a button on his computer, having his cup of tea, and everything will be working. And a lamb the farm. is born. Well, we're now <laughs> starting to grow our own beef, aren't we, in some laboratories in America? They're growing Absolutely, burgers. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's, we're growing our own food. Uh, well, meat, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Mila, do you want to... Inject that. Yeah, um, I had also mentioned that, uh, like the minister said, right, it's not really versus, it's just complementing each other, technology and traditional farming, some practices anyway. Um, so, yes, you can't really do away with the farmer. I think technology is just meant to, uh, say, make it easier for the farmer to run some certain practices and also just for us to keep an eye on uh, behavioral, right? What is the farmer doing? How is he doing it? Is he doing it correctly? Is he producing the right amount of, uh, you know, produce here and there? Is he using the amount, right amount of water? All these are things that can help, you know, induce, uh, re sorry, uh, improve productivity out there, so. And very quickly, Oleg, if you want to just say a couple of short sentences on this topic. Well, you know, I would say that in the major agro-holdings, agro-companies, in the upcoming future, the people will push the buttons. And I don't think that farmers will be able to compete with uh, such companies and productions. But to allow a farmer to be competitive uh, in this field, his or her products of this farmer should be somehow different from these big holdings. Maybe the products should be local, um, of a good, of a better quality, and to develop these uh, farmer activities, we've developed programs. When we, together with farmers of some specific region, we start to produce products that are sustainable for this region, and they are local products from this region. So, some local cheese, for example, it should not be camembert or it should not be parmesan. Uh, in Russia, we have this. Um, uh, cheese makers that are also very competitive uh, on a global uh, scale, on a global stage. But this is not competitive. Uh, you can do it near Moscow. In some regions of Russia, where it, historically they produce some simple uh, soft cheese, this cheese should be different from other cheeses. Then it will get the additional value and it will be competitive and it will raise interest among people. So we develop programs to develop these skills and competences among farmers. I'm afraid that brings us to an end to this session. I think we have a huge round of applause for our panel, John, Mueller and Oleg. Okay, that brings us to lunchtime, ladies and gentlemen, or there are curated visits around the competition areas, and of course there are the Be Change Maker pitches. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy the rest of World Skills 2019. Well done, Chase. Good to meet you. Take care, see you soon.
Thank you.